So maybe we could start now. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. So thank you, Masha, and it's our pleasure to have you among us as, as a guest from the Labex OFL. Uh, just a few words to tell that you are a professor at the University of Stockholm and let's say one of the most prominent uh, specialists of lexical typology <laughs> today. So the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, Est-ce que tout le monde entend? Masha, oui. excusez-moi. Oui. Okay. Oh. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and for having invited me here. Um, and um, uh, we started this process more than four years ago. So things have uh, gone in various directions since then. Uh, I was supposed to come here two years ago, so I wrote this application four years ago. Uh, and uh, so we'll see how much of what I'm going to talk about these days, I have to do with the um, original application and what I have promised to do. I just don't know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so, <laughs> huh? there are some people are still coming. coming. They're still coming. What should yes. we do? No, Dance in the meantime? Yeah, we just continue. Yeah. Okay. And, it's uh, just and when I hear things like um, I'm one of the most prominent people I just want to escape because it's <laughs> the imposter syndrome comes back <laughs> with all its strength. So, um, uh, so yes, most of you present here know me, have already seen me. Uh, and uh, some of you also know what this picture depicts. It's me and our dog, Cairo, in the archipelago of Stockholm. Um, so, um, um, I have promised to talk about lexical typology in various shapes and in, in various directions. So, um, well, all of you, most of you will know what linguistic typology is. Uh, some people have to get updated on this, perhaps. Uh, so, linguistic typology is, in one of the uh, definitions, the study of linguistic patterns that are found cross-linguistically, in particular patterns that can be discovered by solely by cross-linguistic comparison. Oh, it's a whole... Hi. <laughs> I've just started, so it's not, not a big deal. Nice to see you, all, all of you. Right. So, yes. So, um, I started by uh, repeating what linguistic typology is. In one of the de definitions, it's the study of linguistic patterns that are found cross-linguistically, in particular patterns that can be discovered solely by cross-linguistic comparison. And we all know that typological research takes linguistic diversity as its point of departure and it assumes further that the variation across languages is restricted and aims at discovering the systematicity behind it. So there are various kinds of typology. There's grammatical typology, syntactic typology, morphological typology, phonetic typology, phonological typology, sign language typology, you name it. Uh, so what is lexical typology? And there are various versions of definitions, but uh, here's mine. Uh, it's a systematic study of cross-linguistic variation in words and vocabularies. That is the cross-linguistic and typological branch of lexicology. And uh, people very often evoke uh, the classical definition of Adrian Lehrer, Lexical typology is concerned with the characteristic ways in which language packages semantic material into words. It's a good definition. Okay, so again, those of you who were in Fredjus and some other people know that I um, mm. try to define the three main research angles in lexical typology. Um, so onomasiology, semasiology, and lexical grammar interaction. So onomasiology means that we start with some particular semantic domains. We start with denotation or meanings and we go to expressions. So we're interested in how languages cover up a particular domain by means of lexical expressions. So color, body, uh, temperature, how many different distinctions there will be by words and lexical expressions. Uh, the other uh, point of departure, the other research angle is uh, semasiology. 
So we start with expressions and then we go to meanings. So if we know that a particular word means body in reference to the body, the concrete body, what other meanings can this, you, can this word have synchronically or diachronically? So this will be the um, uh, semi-sociological um, approach or perspective. And then we have interaction between lexicon and grammar, because most of grammar is very sensitive to lexical distinctions. And there's a lot of things that happens with particular domains, particular lexical groups, when it comes to how they behave uh, grammatically. So, um, in this lecture, I have promised to talk about lexical typology and morphology. Mm, and uh, as I've said, we'll see uh, what happens here. Uh, it's a huge domain, the interaction between lexical typology and morphology. Um, and uh, I refer you partly to a chapter um, in the um, Oxford Research Encyclopedia in Morphology, a chapter of, on lexical typology and morphology that I um, uh, published together with Luba Veselinova. Um, so morphology is concerned with the study of the internal structure of words, and uh, the two central questions of morphological studies are the systematic co-variation of form and meaning and the combination of morphemes to yield words. Uh, so if we compare lexical typology and morphology, as I said, there are very many points of um, um, uh, overlapping points of interest there, we can say that one of the overarching questions in lexical typology is how the lexicon is organized in terms of structurally more basic and structurally more complex lexical expressions. It's an interesting question, I think. Very rarely discussed, actually. <laughs> Morphology, one of the fundamental questions is what are the smallest meaningful units and how are they combined to form words? So we see this. There's a lot of overlapping here, but these are sort of two different disciplines and people very rarely communicate with each other when it comes to these questions. And it's a far, vast field of research where we know very little about the cross-linguistic variation. So just uh, what I will do in this lecture is I say a few very general things and then we will go into a particular study that I'm um, conducting together with my colleagues Matimia Stamo and Kalle Bustel when we look at one particular question. So we talked about these uh, structurally more basic and more complex lexical expressions. It just to remind you that basic versus non-basic, when, when we mm, discuss this uh, for various reasons, can mean very many different things. Uh, we can talk about structurally basic and structurally complex lexical items. We can talk about basic terms within the domain. We can also talk about basic vocabulary and we can talk about other things. So mm, structurally basic and structurally complex lexical items, there's an enormous cross-linguistic variation. And again, very little research that would take it seriously cross-linguistically. So here we have languages can vary as to what is structurally basic, which words are structurally basic. In some languages, you can allow monomorphemic words. In other languages, you will never allow monomorphemic words. They will also always have some kind of inflectional, derivational uh, things. Uh, what kinds of word formation devices you can have across languages in one language? And also, what do you do with multi-word expressions? Do you have them or don't you? Do you not have them? Again, cross-linguistically, we know very little about that. People work on particular languages, but there's basically no generalizations. Uh, and we know very little. I mean, I really try to discover this kind of um, things. How many uh, basic, structurally basic words you will have in a language, how many different roots you will have in a language as compared to um, derivational devices. Uh, and it seems that this information is extremely difficult to, to get hold of. We just don't know. So for Modern Journal, I have been told that by Mattis List, that um, there's the standard lexicon of German uh, divided into word families. You know, there's like word families that's word that have the same root, basically. 
So the 60,000 words in the standard lexicon of German can be assigned to 8,000 word families. That means 8,000 roots. Where word families share the same root and comprise between 1 and 500 meet, uh, members. Whereas for Inuit, according to Dore, I guess that's the pronunciation, uh, uh, Dore estimates non derived st stems to number um, uh, approximately 760 and derivation affixes about 490. Do you know anything about French or? Yes, or Beja yes. or, or Chinese or For French. There was the dictionary of the, the French roots by Marcel Cohen. Mm -hmm. it was something in the fifties, I think, mm -hmm. it was issued. But I don't remember the, mm -hmm. the figures. I, I really can't. But I mean, it exists for French, mm -hmm. which is not very much a derivational language, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, we know probably for Arabic. Mm -hmm. For Beja, I could count, but I haven't mm -hmm. done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think it's an interesting, very basic question, right? It's a very basic question. And of course, dramatic differences in the packaging and distribution of semantic material among the different groups of manual linguistic elements in a world will be a consequence of that. So if you have a language with very few roots and very many derivational affixes, the semantic material will be packaged differently from a language that has very many roots and very few derivational affixes. So this is something for future research. Mm -hmm. Also, we have this, you know, this, this term, basic terms. So people talk about basic terms within the domain. You are probably all familiar with this concept for color terms, right? You have red and blue will be basic, crimson will not be basic, re greenish will not be basic, uh, light blue will not be basic and all that. So this this definition, the idea that um, coming going back to uh, Berlin and K, all languages possess a small set of words or word senses, each of whose significatum is a color concept and whose significatum jointly partition the psychological color space. So you have basic terms within the domain and there are several criteria for that. I mean, that's a concept that has been severely um, discussed and criticized. But the main criteria that um, have been suggested are these terms will be morphologically simple or at any rate non-compositional. That means that light blue will not be a, the basic term. They are generally known in the whole speech community um, with their meanings generally agreed on. They are salient or frequent. That means people come up with this. If you ask for a color term, they will give you red and blue rather than whatever it can be, turquoise. Um, they are native or at any rate nativized. They are not a hyponym or hyperonym of something. And with this domain, they are not too restricted in, this, uh, in their application. So what you see here is that uh, there are mm, both structural and sort of semantic or frequency, or sorry, uh, frequency criteria. So basic words, basic terms within the domain are morphologically simple and non-transparent. And they're also very frequent and very salient. So this, this idea that there's some connection between morphological simpleness, uh, simplis, simplicity? <laughs> simplicity and uh, salience, frequency, all that. Then we go further to basic vocabulary. Again, at something, a concept that pops up here and there, and people don't really discuss this seriously. So what is a basic vocabulary? Um, Lehmann, yes? Masha, uh, shouldn't we add another point uh, about basic vocabulary uh, concerning the color? Uh, semantic point is that uh, uh, the word shouldn't be is derived from another word. For instance, orange, orange in French. Right. Uh, I think it wouldn't, it yes. shouldn't be mm. considered as basic biscuit because it's derived from the, the fruit. Right? Mm -hmm. the fruit. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, it's one of the criteria. So there are different versions of that. Mm -hmm. So there won't be, and you will say that in a way, um, orange, well, in French, um, it's, um, it looks the same as the fruit, right? Yes, and it's not only that it looks the same. No, no, I mean, there's no, there are no derivational affixes and whatever. In, in no. some other languages, you will clearly see that it is derived because there no, will be, yes. The metonymic use mm -hmm. of 
Right, yes. So, so this transparent, the, this criteria that it should not be transparent is, um, can be um, extended. So it's also, you see the polysemy that is very transparent. You're absolutely right. Yes, yes. Uh, but if we go back to, to basic and non-basic vocabulary, so what is a basic vocabulary? Everyone has heard the word, right? So what is, huh? Yes. yes. <laughs> so what's a basic vocabulary? What, uh, what is a basic vocabulary? We talk about basic vocabulary of a language. What is it? The, the most uh, used in uh, daily use, or by, mm -hmm. by the most, of most speakers use it in the, in the daily use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is it language specific or is it? Yes. It is language specific. Mm -hmm. At least part, partly, because it depends on the culture, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cultural uh, environment, mm -hmm. habit, uh, so on. Right. So here's a definition by Christian Lehmann, who has some kind of, I don't know, it's a, it, it's a collection, a collection of methodological um, articles on how to describe a language. So he has uh, this article on basic vocabulary, and he talks about basic vocabulary of a language which comprise those words that are most useful for the speaker and hearer because they're most frequent in texts of different genres, design, uh, designate concepts that are central to human life, suffice to paraphrase and explain all the other words of the lexicon. So exactly what you said, Stefan. Uh, so it's a basic vocabulary of a language and we see, we see that he um, um, evokes these notions of frequency, semantic centrality and psychological salience. And possible. Well, he doesn't talk about universality, but a little bit. But then there are other versions of basic vocabulary. So there's the Swedish list, which is presumed to be relatively universal and easily applicable across languages for singling out the most stable words in the language. Then there's the natural semantic meta language, which suggests a restrict by uh, Wierzbicka and Goddard, a restricted set of semantic primes concepts that can be demonstrated to be common to all languages are not easily decomposed in terms of other concepts and show a strong tendency to be lexicalized. People also talk about basic vocabulary as words that are acquired by children at an early stage of exposition. And um, I mean, people just use these words <laughs> without actually explaining how they, mm, oh, I think that's an, an, an old, uh, how they come up with this. And what's interesting also, the morphological structure of basic vocabularies on the whole is rarely discussed. Uh, so real, really, rarely discussed. And w you, would you would expect that, okay, if this are, it's a basic vocabulary, something that children acquire very early, something that we use frequently, perhaps most of these words will be monomorphic or non-derived. Mm -hmm. But this is absolutely not so. So for Chinese, it seems, well, again, referring to Matthias List and his colleagues, then 30% of the words in the Swedish list are formed by compounding on derivation. So an unresolved issue in lexical typology on the crossroads to morphology would be to what extent languages vary in their versions of basic vocabulary. That is, how they vary as to which of the concepts in the suggested lists of basic concepts have structurally more basic or more complex exponents and how complexity is achieved in each of these cases? I think it's a very interesting question, actually. There's some, some work on, uh, um, uh, you might know some of your uh, paper by, um, um, by, by Andrei Kibrik that uh, Martin and I published uh, in a special issue of, lingui of linguistics like 10 years ago, where he went through the list of concepts um, in Tomazello's book. Tomazello's book is about his daughter acquiring, what was it, German, English. So her first words. And he goes through these uh, concepts, and these are the first concepts that are acquired by this child. And what Kibrick did was he tried to um, um, translate this list to uh, a couple of languages, so Russian and an Athabascan language, whether these will be simplex or complex. And it turned out that dramatic differences. So some very, very simple concepts in English have 
10 correspondences in Athabaskan and they will all be very long. Some other words that um, you have in English won't have any correspondence and all that. So, so I think this is a very interesting um, uh, issue in, um, in um, cross-linguistic, when it comes to cross-linguistic variation, but we know very, very little about that. So lots of things to do. Now, after all this general, uh, general um, uh, introduction, I will mention a few more restricted approaches where people try to understand how a particular relations, particular domains and particular whatever, uh, semantic can be um, um, described in terms of more struct structurally, more basic, or more complex expressions. So um, uh, this is the so-called issue of motivation and some of the uh, approaches here, some of the um, studies have to do with uh, um, well, a lot of studies on uh, members in intransitive and transitive verb pairs, like kill and die, uh, classical word formation categories, is something about hyperonymy, hyponymy. I will just show you what I mean here uh, and how, what we mean by motivation. So motivation is, among others, a term that um, was um, elaborated on by uh, our late colleague Peter Koch. Uh, where he talks, he suggests a definition that if we take a given word of a given language as a reference point and its meaning M1 as derived from another meaning M2, the meaning M1 may be described as being motivated by the meaning M2, be it diachronic semantic evolution or synchronic polysemy. And so Peter Koch and his uh, colleague Daniele Marzo, um, Marzo, they talk about a motivational square so we have two concepts that are related to each other cognitively or semantically and there's a formal relation uh, between how these two are expressed. So you have this very simple example from causative and anti-causative, so transitives, non-transitives. Uh, you have in Japanese to move in transitive which gives, gives rise, rise to the um, causative to move where you have a causative um, um, suffix. Uh, the same goes for to be angry, intransitive, um, to annoy will be a causative of that. So these two uh, concepts to move intransitively and to move transitively, clearly there's a very, there's a very clear cognitive relation between a semantic relation. One is, uh, one is the causative of the other. Uh, and also to be angry and to annoy the same cognitive relation and you see that it corresponds to causative. So there's a cognitive relation and a formal relation, right? Whereas in Russian it will be the other way around. So you have uh, the transitive verb двигать, to move, will give rise to the anti-causative to move intransitively and also to annoy the transitive verb will give rise to to be angry. So you have the uh, the opposite relation in the in the um, uh, in the formation of that, and there's a huge literature about that. So this transitive transitivizing and anti-transitivizing languages um, have been described by um, or studied by several people. So Nidalkov in Leningrad, Haspelmat, and Joanna Nichols has been pursuing this for many many years. So the idea is that you will have uh, genetic and aerial patterns in which of the um, uh, strategies languages will will uh, exploit uh, for this couple. So this is an example of what can be done in restricted parts of lexicon. Uh, then the interesting studies, um, well then there's uh, um, some kind of uh, um, cross-linguistic studies on unusual um, and other um, uh, word formation strategies, uh, uh, action nominals, uh, um, whatever, uh, incoatives and all that. And also some studies which, are, are, they're very few, but they're quite interesting. Studies um, inspired by research on human categorization. So people working in human ca categorization talk about three, well, the basic level of categorization. You know, that's where we, um, that's the, mo the most general level where concepts can still plausibly be represented by a global e image. And uh, 
um, there's this idea that concepts on this level will very often be um, mm, correspond to uh, uh, like simple underived words, whereas um, concepts on the lower level or on the superordinate level will be derived from them. The, it's, there's very little research, but there are some kind of tendencies. So here we have uh, the, well, the same in English, of course, but uh, the basic level for talking about plants. So plants will be superordinate, but then you have different kinds of plants. So you have uh, flowers and tree and things that on the subordinate level uh, will very often be used by, formed by compounding. So compounding will be used as a general method for talking about uh, subordinate level uh, from the basic level. So you will have uh, apple tree, uh, uh, pear tree, prune tree. Uh, and when it comes to the other way around, so you talk about superordinate uh, levels, so talking about well, more general concepts. In some languages, you will have uh, the method of co-compounding. You have this in Chinese as well, right? So if you have, here we have an example from Kalam. So if you talk about people, mm, that will be man and woman. If you talk about children, it will be son, daughter. So you take a couple of uh, concepts on the, on the basic level and you combine them and you get a superordinate um, um, term. So there's some research on this, not so much. Again, something that can be pursued further. Uh, and what I will be talking about now is a research that uh, uh, I am involved in when it comes to a possible new addition to this research on, on restricted uh, patterns in the lexicon, and that is antonymy. So now I will, let's say I will end this share. And I will, uh, what do I do here? I stop share, and then I open. Christian mm, is not here. Um, I will go to this one. No, desktop. Yes, desktop. And then. But this is not. Yeah, that's what I mean. Stop sharing. Isabel, can you switch off your mic? Yeah, uh, let's see. This is always very interesting, isn't it? Um, Isabel, Ch hi. So, <laughs> a share. Desktop, share, you will see all my secret, mm-mm. Uh, there's something coming on happy words, is that what you... Yes, yes. I want to so share happy words. On, on other computers, but not on the screen. Okay. <laughs> mm. okay but yes, I, I all right, oh, okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> okay. And then I do slideshow, play from start, hoop. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a study, uh, okay, uh, that um, mm, uh, we have uh, had various versions of the title here. Um, mm, uh, because we have been doing this for many years. Uh, so this version is called, is called Unhappy Words. And uh, this is a study um, carried out by uh, myself, Matimia Stamo from Helsinki and Carlo Kalle Bostel, which who used to be my PhD student, but now is a lecturer in, uh, in Bergen. Uh, and some of you have been involved in that, in this study, uh, Mark has yeah. helped us with yeah. some data, but you probably don't remember that. That no, was years ago. That is years ago. <laughs> Science takes time, you know, research. It's <laughs> so so um, what we are looking at is um, um, antonymy. And we are interested in to what extent um, antonymy can be lexical or derivational. So we have this couple here, big and small. They're two different words that are not 
not related to each other at all. But then on the other hand, we have happy, unhappy, where unhappy is derived from happy. So the question that we are pursuing here is what, which types of property words are typically targeted by lexical or derivational antonymy and why? And uh, we would do this uh, cross-linguistically. Instead of zooming into one language, we look at um, 37 antonym antonymic pairs in 55 languages by systematically comparing this, this, uh, uh, these pairs. Uh, so um, this is something that we started doing, well, as I said, several years ago. Research takes time. Uh, and we were, in, we got interested in that um, because mm, the question of why you have happy and unhappy pops up in various, um, in much research on semantics and in uh, theoretical morphology. Mm. So um, uh, what I will talk about now is um, various, as a background for, for this work various studies on antonymy, typological work on negation, early generalizations on words like unhappy, and uh, semantic classes of adjectives across languages as um, uh, researched by Dixon and then Eichenwald. So let's start with these uh, studies on antonymy. So antonymy, antonymy is a very popular uh, topic in lexicology, in semantic theories and logic. And there's also a growing psycholinguistic, neurolinguistic, and corpus-based research um, focusing on antonymy. So we have these traditional distinctions going back to Aristotle. We have types of opposition. We have contradictory and complementary antonyms, dead and alive, and there's nothing in between. Well, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm dead. Yes, I'm dead. <laughs> And then you have contrary, big and small, so there's the scale. Uh, so words like big and small, there's a lot of discussions on scalarity, what kinds of uh, scales there. are. Uh, now, um, what is antonymy? I don't know if, if you've had a chance of thinking about it. It's a very elusive concept, actually, or, or um, a phenomenon. So in structuralist approaches to the lexicon, and in much lexicographic work, Antonymy is taken to be the most basic means of organizing the adjective lexicon. So words are really connected by antonymic relations. And there's also an extensive psycholinguistic research on antonymy, which um, mm, says that uh, when we have things in, in memory, uh, they are very often organized, so and, and we have antonymic associations and all that, so it's very important. And also this gro corpus growing research in antonymy. So antonymy is a pretty hot topic. Um, and there's also uh, some evidence for antonymy being a very um, um, prominent um, relation in um, various, in some, at least some languages. So for Walpiri, Hale, uh, talked, talks about the initiation version of Walpiri when boys, when they initiate, they go to special houses and they have to talk the opposite language. That's pretty fun. So they, <laughs> they, they, they are never taught what, lang what it is, but they have to acquire it. They're guardians who speak this opposite language to each other and these uh, boys have to acquire this, and it's a, it's a, so uh, if you want to say, um, I go up, you will say something like, he comes down. So everything will be the opposite, and uh, it's, a, it's a secret language. And I think Yvonne Trice mentioned that something like that exists in some of the Ethiopian languages, that if you have taboo situations, you will use the antonym or the opposite. Are you familiar with things like that in your languages? No, mm. but it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, right? So antonymy seems to be a real and important relation. But um, so, so when people talk about antonymy, mm, they evoke somehow tacitly perhaps uh, the notion of oppositeness. Oppositeness, where do you stress it? I don't know. 
<laughs> so so it's, uh, it has to do with logical incompatibility and also minimal difference or maximal similarity. So, for instance, a stone cannot be both uh, big and small. So this is the logical incompatibility. But this is not enough because a stone can't be um, mm, big and generous at the same time. These are very different things. So to be an antonym, to be antonyms, these two words have to be pretty similar to each other, but they will have some minimal difference. So that's, that's the thing. Um, uh, and then there's a whole discussion about what antonymy is. Uh, w whether it is a lexical relation, it's about words, about construals, about concepts, about um, words in use. Uh, and uh, what we see is that, well, talking about lexical relations between words is too simplistic because one and the same word can have different, different antonyms in different contexts, of course. So old can be an antonym of young and new, depending on whether it's about people and animals or about objects. White is normally the antonym of black, but in the context of wine it will be bread. Uh, tall is a, um, opposite to short or to low, again, depending on the, on the context. And there's also psychological research that people talk about goodness of antonymy. So some antonymic couples are very good. So big and small, fine, good and bad, wonderful. But Holy and evil is a little bit worse, and holy and bad is even worse. So the idea is that <laughs> the most, the, be the best antonyms are those words where you have one clear dimension where they can be opposed to each other. So good and bad, you only have evaluation. But holy and evil, you have evaluation, but also morality. <laughs> so they... The more dimensions you have, the more difficult it becomes. And also the relative position of the meanings on these dimensions. So the opposition, the antonymic couple, hot and cold, is better than cold or cool, or hot or cool, because hot and cold are at the same distance from the middle, whereas hot and warm or hot and cool will be either on the same um, side of the middle or at different differences. You understand what I talk about? I mean, it's pretty trivial, but, uh, but it's, it's interesting because you, when you start thinking about that, you see that antonymy is very heterogeneous. So theoretical semantics um, says that dimensional adjectives, that are those, those um, uh, words, those concepts that are best when it comes to antonymy. So you can say things like big and small, thick and thin, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas for other domains, antonymy is much less um, well, de much worse defined, and you have clusters. So brave, bold, courageous, cowardly, timid, fearful, all that. So it's much more complicated. All right. There's also corpus-based uh, research on antonymy. Again, talking about goodness of antonymy, and that's also quite interesting because what you find is that. Mm, and antonyms very often seem to co-occur in corpus. Uh, so you can even mm, understand which were the anim an an antonym antonyms by analyzing corpora. They, they seem to co-occur in various things like uh, mm, bad and good, bad but not good, you know, all this. So there's uh, quite some extensive research on that, and it turns out that um, there's like a, um, people have come, um, well, drawn the um, conclusion that uh, languages will have canonical antonyms, a limited core of highly opposable couplings that are strongly entrenched as pairs in memory and conventionalized as pairs in text and discourse, while all other couplings form a scale more, from more to less strongly related. And these uh, dimensions will be speed, luminosity, strength, size, with merit and thickness. Very interesting research, but of course confined to just a few languages. There's something on Japanese, but otherwise it's English and uh, uh, Swedish and a couple of other languages. So, right. What is also, mm, what we, I mean, all these things, we will need them for talking about this study. 
Um, also, in connection with um, antonymy, people often talk about markedness. You know this concept, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, so people will say, well, big is unmarked, whereas small is marked. Or happy is unmarked, whereas unhappy will be marked. And this notion of markedness seems to be very, um, very, um, how would I say? Elusive. Ah, elusive, elusive. Um, so there, it's used in various versions, but it seems that the most important components there are um, uh, um, valence and magnitude. So we're talking about big and small. They either have magnitude, big is more of something, and small is less of something. And valence, if you have difficult or easy, difficult will be positive, easy, no, sorry, um, uh, negative, and easy will be, will be positive. So what is important for us is that in studies of, of antonymy, people very often talk about polarity. And polarity means several different things, but among other things, some, in some theoretical work, it has been suggested that negative um, element, negative semantically negative element, is important for at least some antonymic things. So it's a theoretical literature. So, so there's something negative in the meaning of little, in the meaning of unhappy, and all that. All right, okay. So this, um, we can draw some interim conclusions of antonymy. We see that there's a recurrent semantic relation between members of an antonymic couple, at least for some, the best antonymic couples. The recurrent semantic relations, meaning that the two words, like big and small, happy and happy, they're very similar, but they're also dissimilar to, to something. So this, is, this recurrent relation, uh, given this recurrent semantic relation, we may expect that at least some of these words may also be formally related to each other. Remember this motivational square, right? So if kill and die, move and move, they have this um, uh, semantic similarity, but also some recurrent difference, and it corresponds to, say, causative or anti-causative thing. So we might expect that the members in antonymic pairs will be formally related. Is this very boring, or it's all right? <laughs> Tell me, <laughs> and, uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you something different. <laughs> also, given that the idea of polarity, that something negative, pops up here and there uh, in discussions of antonymy, we would expect that these formal markers of relatedness between the members of the antonymic couple will have something to do with, with negation in a broad sense. And in fact, this idea has been um, used <laughs> in earlier, um, what I say, um, well, by some people. So, you know uh, Orwell's 1984, uh, where um, uh, um, the inhabitants in this state um, are um, expected to use a special language, Newspeak. Uh, which is similar, which is very simple in various uh, various respects, and um, mm, it should have a small vocabulary. And uh, uh, Orwell says, in addition, any word could be made negative by adding the prefix "un." By such methods, it was found possible <coughs> to bring about an enormous diminution of vocabulary. Given, for instance, the word "good," there was no need for such a word as "bad." since the required meaning was equally well, indeed better, expressed by ungood. We find it also the same idea in Esperanto. So the creators of Esperanto thought that... Huh? Read yeah, well, I think, no, it was, it was, it was earlier, it was earlier, <laughs> it was earlier. So also this idea that, well, why should we bother about uh, having special, special uh, roots or stems for in antonymic couples. So, so antonymy is basically 
um, formed by um, by adding mal to the sort of positive or to one of the members. So we have um, mal alta, low, mal bella, nasty, mal bona, bid, bad, mal granda, little, mal rapida, slow, mal seca, wet. Uh, and even, uh, let's see, which was, what was it? Um, ah, I think that hot is mal calda. Mm -hmm. No, uh, cold, which is very weird because in languages you normally don't have it. So that temperature words for hot and cold in normal languages, but in Esperanto one is derived from the other. We also have something like that in some languages. So in hoop, belonging to Nadahoop family Amazonia. Uh, this is the data provided by Patty Epps. You see that mm, there are mm, not so many real property concepts or adjectives or whatever, but some of the most central um, uh, for some, for some, the, well, antonyms, for the most central antonyms, you use the negative marker. So deep, from deep you get shallow, which is undeep. Uh, not slippery, light will be not heavy, dull will be not sharp. So this, this happens in normal languages as well. Uh, so um, we started thinking about all this, trying to collect all kinds of data and, and ideas. And um, mm, uh, um, we understood that mm, there's a lot of work on negation in various versions. Uh, standard negation, prohibitive, state of predications, negative, indefinite. But there's no large scale work on derivational negation for words like unhappy, sleepless and dislike. So that's um, uh, um, one of the reasons why we wanted to look at this more properly. And our questions, our hypotheses were also um, um, inspired by a not very well-known little book by Carl Zimmer, 1964. Has anyone heard about it? No. No, no it's a dissertation on ethical negation and it's, it's a cross-linguistic, it's typological work which is very interesting given the time and place. So we, he, I think it, it, he defended it somewhere in, in the United States. So he looked, he looked at some um, Indo-European languages, basically, mm, well, uh, and a few other languages. And his um, study was also inspired by, by the earlier work on Swedish, German, and English. Uh, and um, uh, he looked at how these languages, um, whether they had um, negative affixation or affixal negation. And he formulated a couple of interesting hypotheses, uh, which uh, were then recycled many times in theoretical morphology. So one hypothesis is two versions of this derivational universal. He, he calls it universal, actually, which is also quite interesting. So the first hypothesis is negative affixes are used primarily with adjectival stems that have a positive value on the of evaluative scales such as good, bad, desirable, undesirable. Well, this hypothesis is too strong because most words, um, well, you have exceptions. Uh, you have, um, uh, sorry, no, this is, um, uh, sorry, um, but most words will not have this very clear positive or negative uh, flavor. So in the other hypothesis is negative affixes are not used with adjectival stems that have a negative value on evaluative scales such as good, bad, desirable and undesirable. And here we have exceptions you can have, uncorrupt, unselfish. But these are at least hypotheses, very interesting hypotheses. So, so the idea is that if you have words like good and bad, you can expect ungood, but not unbad. Uh, something. Uh, and he also looked at um, some particular languages, Russian, uh, which has a lot of um, uh, negative um, ethical negation, uh, and it is much more, much less restricted than, say, the Germanic languages. But still, there are restrictions. So, if you have um, 
uh, in a language like Russian, you have m many uh, triads or tetrads. So you can have, here you have high and low, but you also have unhigh. You don't have unlow. In some cases, you have even tetrads. So, uh, yes. Um, so, so he has this hypothesis and also another hypothesis or uh, directions for future research. Another problem for further investigation would be the degree to which there's a cross-linguistic similarity in the concepts that are designated by simplex terms and the degree to which antonym pairs of the schema X versus un X can be matched in different languages having negative affixes. So this idea whether there will be the same con concepts that are simplex words and the same complex where you will have derivational antonymy or whether languages will um, will uh, differ. So these are s several hypotheses and um, uh, departing from this hypothesis and from this uh, earlier uh, research, we uh, started now on our study. So we are interested in property expressions. Well, um, Zimmer um, had, um, um, he worked with adjectives not a big deal for European languages. For us, it's more difficult. So we are interested in property expressions that can be considered as opposites or antonyms uh, in the broader sense to each other, like a big house, a small house, a happy person, unhappy person. Uh, we try to focus on abnormal modification, but this turned out to be difficult. And we Foc our focus is further narrowed to a list of 37 antonym pairs that form our questionnaire. So, so our basic question is, which types of property words are typically targeted by derivational versus lexical antonymy and why? Across languages. Uh, and we had a lot of trouble with terminology. So in the end, we mm, agreed to have our own terminology, not talking about basic, derived, complex and all that, because that's, as, as I said in the beginning, these are very uh, elusive terms. So we use uh, the words negative constructed forms, where the added derivational element has the semantics of negation in a broad sense. And we have plain forms. These are not derived with an element that has the meaning of negation in a broad sense. So. Uh, here, how we code our data, just to show you what is meant by plain and negative constructed. Um, so we have a couple good and bad for English. Well, the first antonym is plain, the, first, the second antonym is plain, and we don't have any negative constructed forms for either the first or the second. Uh, then we have happy and happy, not a big deal, so the first antonym is Plain, the second is not plain, it's negative constructed. Now we have French, profond, peu profond. Uh, we have decided to code peu profond as negative constructed because peu has this negative semantics in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. And the element doesn't have to be morphologically bound, but it's sort of, um, um, yes. Then we have examples like uh, Estonian, where you have unelik and unnitu for happy and happy. Now both are derived from unne, which means happiness. Uh, but we say, say that unnitu, unhappy, has a privative or curative suffix without, whereas unelik is just an adjectival, an adjectival suffix. So we call them as plain for happy and negative constructed for the unhappy. You get it? Uh, I mean, we tried all kinds of coding and all kinds of um, uh, strategies for many times. So we tested how this would work and that's how we came up with this. Then we have um, cases like Turkish, possible, impossible. Now, impossible has the privative, the curative privative suffix cis even though it is not mm -hmm. derived from word for possible. 
but we still code it as negative constructor because it does have this negative element. And then we have the last example is from hoop, happy, unhappy. Happy is a property word, whereas uh, unhappy is an idiomatic verbal expression. Um, one's, heart, one's heart spirit is ending. And we have lots of examples of that, but we um, ended up with not glossing them as um, either plain or constructed. We just don't gloss them as, um, as, as property words. But why, Masha? Because you could also argue that it is a part ending or finishing this part in negative, also like put in French. Right, but it's not a property word. I mean, it's a whole, that, that's the thing. So again, we tried with various versions of that, but we ended up with not treating this as a word, as a lexical expression. Yeah. So, okay. So what we did is we, we compiled a questionnaire with 37 pairs of antonyms, and respondents are asked to translate noun phrases containing a modifier plus a head noun. And these come in antonymic pairs, long stick, short stick. And we also ask for additional information, glossing factors influencing choice between alternative expressions, information on negation, etc. Uh, for choosing these couples, we try to show different cases of this, along this goodness of antonymic continuum. So we have antonyms coming from different groups of property con concepts as they are um, listed by Dixon. So we have core, those property concepts that pop up as adjectives in languages with a closed adjective class, like dimension, age, value, color, peripheral, uh, which pop up as adjectives in languages with larger mm -hmm. Um, uh, um, adjective class, physical property, human propensity, speed, and then other difficulty, similarity, qualification, position. We try to include these canonical antonyms, and we, when we gloss our examples or when we tag them, we try to make sure um, that we um, tag uh, our uh, examples and our data for valence, positive, negative, and magnitude, more, and more or less, long and short. So, Masha, the task was to translate from English? Yes, from English. yes. Yeah. Occasionally yeah. from other languages, so, so there was another. And this is, and, and I will just say a few words about the methodological considerations. This turned out to be extremely difficult. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, first, it was like a, a questionnaire with a um, list, but with context. So um, uh, people have been using lists for collecting cross-linguistic data on various kinds of things. So you have the Swedish lists, you have lists for borrowed words and all that. And there are huge problems with that because the assumption underlying these projects is often that the concepts in the lists are easily understandable and easily translatable across languages, which is, of course, far from being true. Well, you think that mm -hmm. if you give something like a good, a good car, a good house, or a bad house, people will know what we mean. But uh, yes, good has turned out to be very problematic. M some of these things have turned out to be very problematic. Now, the exact semantic, <laughs> the exact semantics is um, a pragmatic. Mm, consideration. So you don't need to be exactly have exact symmetry, but you want to have some kind of equivalent. Uh, but uh, so depending on what on what your study you have, but there are obvious pitfalls that you want to avoid because words have different versions, a uh, different meaning. So dull will be a dull knife and a dull person. Uh, high, as I said. It, or long can be long and short and long and uh, high and whatever. So that's why uh, you have to be more specific about what has to be translated. And one, one possibility is to define your concepts, like this is now being done in Concepticon. And this requires quite some energy and semantic, <laughs> <laughs> semantic yes. awareness. So what we did is a half... Um, cowardly attempt to at least narrow down the meanings of the words that we're talking about to context. So that's why we have a long stick 
or a um, thick book or whatever. So we, we give this context so people will understand what we're talking about. Still this creates problems. So I, I, I gathered mm, some material on mm, Akan, for instance, and people, even though I had dull, uh, dull knife, they translated it as dull person. Yes, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't understand that it would be so difficult. Uh, also, we have to give the, these antonyms in in pairs, right? So, so big or small. And first, uh, our first um, intuitive um, solution would be to to well this markedness thing. We know that well normally, but big and small. Uh, good and bad and whatever. Uh, then it turned out again that this is uh, also pro very problematic for various re reasons. So we decided that the order of these antonyms was sensitive to uh, valence and magnitude. I mean, not for all the antonyms that we had, but for those, those um, antonyms where we could see a clear difference between opposition and valence, so one where positive, the other was negative, we chose the positive first and then the negative. For those that have this magnitude difference, we chose the bigger before the, uh, before the smaller. But then there's, there are several pairs where this order is less obvious. Uh, and this, some research, as I said, on the order of, um, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't mention that, on um, corpus uh, studies on antonymy where people for several languages come up Mm, with the results that um, uh, antonyms tend to appear in, in the same order. So big normally precedes small, you know, these kinds of things. Okay, so here are our antonyms and we code here different colors. So we have large and big, small, little, long, wide, deep, tall, high, thick, old, good, beautiful, black. Then we have hard, heavy, sharp, wet, clean, hot, warm, bright, rich, wealthy, happy, clever, kind, good, generous, well, brave, strong, alive, fast, quick, difficult, true, normal, common, important, possible, correct, near, right. So these are our, uh, our pairs. And as I've said, the main research question is which types of property words are typically targeted by derivational and lexical antonymy and why? So we had five hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is the second antonym should be more likely to accept negative constructive expression than the first one. So the second, this is the one which is less positive and less on the magnitude if it is applicable and then something else. Uh, then um, Evaluatively, negative terms should be more likely to accept neg constructed expression than evaluatively positive terms, so valence. So we are, uh, um, there's a higher chance that you will have ungood than unbad in the language. Hypothesis three, terms denoting smaller magnitude should be more likely to accept negative constructed expressions than terms denoting greater magnitude. So there's a higher chance that you will have unbig than unsmall in the language. Core opposition should be more likely expressed with plain forms, uh, whereas neck constructive forms would be more likely found in the category other. And then we hope that our hypothesis was that one of the hypotheses that would be a trade-off in the languages. So if you use, um, if you have many derivational, um, antonyms, you will have less lexical and the other way around. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still not very boring. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> okay, so here's our language sample. Unboring. Half boring. Unboring. Un unboring. Okay, unboring. thanks. <laughs> unboring. <laughs> so here's our language sample. Uh, many languages, 55 languages, um, and you see some from Africa and, um, um, as I've said, uh, uh, some people here have helped us, but not also here. Um, so it's quite an impressive sample, 55 languages, 23 families, but of course Indo-European and Eurelic are over-representative. Um, 
We also had some other hypotheses, but it turned out that it's very difficult to get data. Um, we have some other recurrent methodological problems. Mm, as I've said, um, um, it was difficult to get good equivalence in many cases, and for some cases it was really dramatic. So for Umpit Hamu, uh, our uh, consultant Jean Christophe Verstrate writes that this language is basically dead. So his data comes from come from um, dictionaries and corpus that he had compiled, and not or not all of these words are there. So for this language, it was difficult. It was we um, we thought that we would include it, even though uh, we don't have data for all all the. And then there were um, all kinds of other problems. For instance, massive polysemy. So for some languages, good and bad are used for basically all evaluation. So uh, brave will be good, wise will be good, generous will be good. <laughs> what else? Um, yes, so um, uh, yes, clever will be good. Um, but anyway, so we um, proceeded, we processed and validated the raw questionnaire data many times, really many times. So we had some research assistants, some students who helped us, and then we validated that when we had discussions with each other. Uh, and um, uh, so the main question, so I, I hope that by now uh, we, are, we agree on all the details in the processing and, and in the uh, statistics behind the data. Uh, so what we then coded or how we counted our statistics, and that's where Carle Burstel comes in. Um, we are interested in whether or not a specific strategy that is plain or non-constructed is possible for each antonym member for each language of our sample. So for each antonym member, for each antonym pair, for each language, uh, we chose be choose between one of three values. Strategy exists, strategy is not found, and there's no relevant expression. So, so here's the first hypothesis. The second antonym should be more likely to accept negative constructed expression than the first one. Well, it is confirmed. Uh, the plain form is more common for most antonyms, but the second antonym is more likely to use negative constructed forms. So you see this uh, uh, there are not very many negative constructed forms for the first pair, the first member in, in a couple, and there are many more for the second. So the first hypothesis is confirmed, and we can, yes, no language uses uh, plain antonym, antonyms more for the first antonym than for the second. Um, right. Uh, then What's this? Uh, oh, we can do all kinds of things, so perhaps I will not talk about this. Um, we also, or not we, but Carle um, did a lot of modeling. A logistic mixed effects model shows that the second antonym is significantly more likely to appear with a negative constructed form than the first one. Um, all right, but uh, uh, if we break this more general pattern into uh, valency, valence, and um, magnitude, we have these two hypotheses two and three. Evaluatively negative terms should be more likely to accept negative constructed expression than evaluatively positive terms, so relative. So there's a higher chance that you will have un-good uh, than unbad. And this is, this is confirmed as well. So again, um, a logistic mixed effects models show that negative valence items are significantly more likely to appear with a negative constructed form than positive valence items. So you will have more, uh, there's, a ch there's a higher chance that you will have mm, ungood then you will have unbad. Unbad is much less usual. Uh, then terms denoting smaller magnitude should be more likely to accept negative constructed expression than terms denoting greater magnitude. 
mm, there's a higher chance that you will have unbig than unsmall. And guess what? This is also confirmed. Good luck. <laughs> Again with the same modeling. <laughs> Uh, then we have this. Core oppositions should be more likely expressed with plain forms, whereas negative constructed forms would be more likely found in the category other. And peripheral pairs would be situated between core and other in this respect. That is, uh, it's much less likely that you will have unbig, unsmall than um, impossible or untrue. So this core is, you know, value, um, um, age, these things, whereas peripheral and, and other, this, these are things like possible, impossible, true, false, correct, incorrect, happy, unhappy, all that. Uh, and um, uh, if you just look at this, it seems that the hypothesis is confirmed, but it is not. So if you apply statistical methods, it, it, it shows that there is no significant uh, difference, which was a little bit surprising. And we also hope that based on the principle of economy, there should be a trade-off between lexical and derivational expression. There, that is, there should be an inverse correlation between the frequency of plain versus negative constructed expression in each antonym pair, um, in, in each antonym pair. Uh, so if a language has many derivational antonyms, it will have less lexical antonyms and the other way around. Um, well, there's some evidence that this should be, but it's not very strong. Um, yes, and here we have some words uh, that, that tend to have double expressions in quite a number of languages. So even in English you see sad, unhappy, uh, incorrect. You can have languages where it is both a lexical expression and a, well, a plain and negative uh, constructed. Strange, odd, dirty, false and some of these. Um, so um, um, uh, yes, so some of them tend to have both plain and negative constructed uh, forms. So overall, for this study, many of our hypotheses are confirmed. The members associated with the second antonym, negative evaluation and less magnitude, are more likely to accept negative constructed form than the first antonym, the positive, more magnitude antonym counterpart. Most items are expressed with a single strategy rather than double, po double, which points to this principle of economy. But we do not see this expected decline across the classes, core, peripheral, other, in the use of negative constructed forms. So it's good news, news that we have uh, confirmed our hypothesis. However, it's a little bit like, uh, what, the, what do we say, a big, a uh, mountain that gave birth to a mouse, or <laughs> what's the expression? In a way, we were I am slightly disappointed because our original assumption was that languages will have lots of these um, uh, derived antonyms when it's such a clear relation, and we have languages like English, German, Swedish, Russian, where there are plenty and plenty and plenty of negative, um, negatively derived antonyms. Um, well, it turns so it turned out to be a disappointment in a way. So um, uh, these um, negative constructed forms are in general fairly rarely used in the expression of antonymy across the languages of our sample. So there may be different reasons for that. One reason is that um, we have an, not so many languages, uh, not so many um, Native American Indian languages, or what's the word now? The native languages of Americas. So like hoop. So in the region of Amazon, it seems that this, the pattern of deriving uh, shallow from deep and small from, from big and all that, it's quite, quite frequent, but we only have hoop. 
Uh, I have also some article about um, uh, well, languages spoken in, in Northern America where you also have this kind of pattern, but we don't just don't have any 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 data apart from one or two articles that we can't use because it's not systematic. So so there may be regions in the world where there's a lot of this stuff, but we just uh, haven't come across. Uh, 55 languages is a little bit too little for, for the language of the world. But there might be also a deeper reason for that, because uh, after all, uh, the best antonyms, um, these most canonical antonyms are very frequent words. So if you think about big and small, um, um, deep and shallow, good and bad, they're very, very frequently used words. And uh, words that are frequently used tend to be, in a way, non-transparent or simple, right? So that might be something like that. So that might be another reason, a, a more, a deeper reason for um, the non-frequency of these, um, uh, of these um, 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 strategies across the languages of the world. So that's all. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of work. And uh, we are very grateful to all the language experts who contributed their data through our questionnaire and also to our research assistants um, who have uh, helped us to code and uh, tag the data uh, and all that. Thanks. So, time for more questions or remarks, also from people online. What, what do I do now? And okay. show. Yes, on the discussion list. Masha, have you published anything on, on this topic? We are, we are in the process, en train. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we are finishing this paper mm -hmm. and we are brushing up our data because, um, so we, because we want to, to make it um, accessible and transparent. Mm -hmm. And our own database has some um, dirty things. So we are, we are brushing up and we hope to be, to be finished, um, well, in one or two months. Oh, mm -hmm. There's a chat some, somewhere. Ah, je confirm. Okay. All right. No, no questions so far. No questions. Question. Yes. So, <coughs> about the um, the interpretation about your results, mm -hmm. which you said that you were disappointed at. I mean. You are not. Not necessarily, <laughs> because I, I, if I think back of what you said in the beginning that antonymy is kind of a concept that is maybe not really useful or real, doesn't your study... Yes. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, but, the, uh, I confirm this, but in order to, to assess that, you would need to find a way to assess how likely it would be uh, if antonymy were a useful and real concept uh, cognitively, how likely it would be that you would find negative morphology on uh, on antonyms, and I don't know how you could do that, unless if you looked in in other parts of the grammar of the same languages. I don't know, maybe reversive verbal morphology or something. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's very it's a very interesting question because uh, I I wasn't even aware of the uh, the debates. Uh, among those people who work on, on antonymy, because we all, I mean, we all have textbooks and semantics, you know, like antonymy, ha, huh? <laughs> lexical relation, very clear. Mm -hmm. And then it's just uh, so many different things that come in. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, to what extent is antonymy real in, 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 in across languages of the world? I have no idea. I but mean, I guess I, I give. Is that the, the, the problem of, um, of marketness, mm -hmm. if you, s you look at scalar uh, notions, mm -hmm. so obviously the scale of big is not comparable to the scale of small. Mm -hmm. Big has a larger scale than mm -hmm. small, so how can, they, how can they be really opposite? They are not at opposite ends of the same scale, obviously, if you see what I mean, mm. uh, big and small. Mm. Because bi the scale of that to which the adjective big applies covers the whole, I mean, if we're talking about length mm -hmm. of humans, for instance, covers mm -hmm. the entire possible um, 
uh, area, whereas the scale of small is a, is, a, is a much smaller one. That's why you can ask how big is he speaking mm -hmm. of a child, or whereas you can't ask about the giant how small he is. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you suggest then? Well, maybe that autonomy is not... It's not a real, a real, real thing. thing. It might be, yes, it might be an, a conclusion. But, but the fact that it's, it is still, that we still find these examples, and that you have evidence from psycholinguistic evidence. Yes, but again, I mean, psycholinguistic evidence, that, that's interesting because psycholinguistic evidence is about just a few languages. So that's, that's the problem. And the yeah. theoretical morphological research, where this is something that people have written hundreds of pages about, again, it's, it's just confined to a few European languages. So it seems that we really don't know so much about the the conceptual side of this and to what extent it is a real notion in other languages. I don't know. How yes. did you arrive at the 37 autonomous pairs? Was that largely based on Dixon? It was That's based, sort of yes, it, yes, it was. And we had a few, and we, we had a few more. Then, but uh -huh. then it turned out that they were, we had to shorten this list because people were, so we had the, the difference between impo impossible and improbable. Possible and improbable, how easy is it? Mm -hmm. Uh, we had uh, uh, light and uh, bright. Then it turned out that this is also very difficult, so we had to shorten some of these things. But it was based. It was based on on his uh, on his groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I guess that if we had started now, we would have done many things differently. Now we're def <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> <laughs> yes. So so uh, so so I just think that it, this opens up. A, a can of worms, in a way. Just a question for you, please. You said you probably don't have enough data points for uh, to make any kind of aerial conclusions, but <coughs> at least for like Indo-European and Uralic, so Shef, you do have a lot of points. Have you tried to look into whether the the families are internally homogeneous, or, or whether there's a difference between, let's say, Indo-European and Uralic? There is some di there is some difference. We are we are looking we are looking into it, and within the Indo-European, there's also something very special going on with Slavic and Baltic languages. Yes, 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 yes that's why we had lots of them, and they just pop up because they use lots and lots of negative. Uh, are they similar to Uralic or? No, 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 not not completely, not completely. And Ural in Uralic, that will be. Carative, privative, these things like that. So it's it's expressed in a well completely different way. Uh, and one of the um, hypotheses about the Slavic languages, why it has so many of those, is that mm, the negative form uh, suffix or whatever it is, prefix, <laughs> is the same as the standard negation. Um, and so it might be that this promotes the use the use of uh, a derivational uh, negation as well. So we had we, uh, one of our initial hypotheses would be that we would find differences between languages that have dramatically different um, um, derivational affixes from nega standard negation, and those that that use the same. But again, we didn't have so much. Do you understand what you're, what I'm talking about? So if you have a language like in a in a Uralic language, you have a carative suffix. Uh, for negate for derivational negation, but you have something completely different for standard negation. Uh, this will be very far um, apart. But in the Slavic language, it's like a continuum, so things get compressed into one word uh, when they started being when, when they start their life as, as standard negation, as standard, something like that. Mm -hmm. But again, we just to, had too little data. So there is no difference like within Slavic. There is some difference, yes, but we should look into it. And uh, I mean, yes, and, and and it's interesting because if you have a language where you can have, you know, we have большой, не большой, не маленький, маленький. So in those cases, we have big and small, and then you have unbig and small, which you can allow. For instance, for Russian, you will have a whole scale. So it's a scale uh, where you have uh, big and big and little little. Mm -hmm. uh, in other cases you have something different, so they, they have a um, um, division of labor, so uh, you have um, 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 
I was thinking about uh, what you can, yes, so you, you can have like um, deep and shallow and then you have undeep. So for some cases, if you're talking about an armchair, it is deep. I don't know, in, in English is it deep? No. No. So in Russian it's deep. And French Yes. And if it's not deep, it's undeep. But you can't say it's shallow. But for other cases, or you can have, um, if you talk about injury, because you can have um, a deep injury, in Russian, глубокая рана. Uh, do you say this in, in English? In French, you say You say, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's and, and if it's not very deep, it's undeep. You can't say it's shallow in Russian. So the, mm -hmm, yes. So you say, so, so you, you can, uh, these different um, antonyms, lexical and uh, derivational, they can go in different directions. They can be used for different, different purposes, different pragmatic purposes. And this was, in fact, something that we wanted to explore from the start, that if languages have these triads and tetrads, how would they be different and, and, and similar to each other? But it turned out that we just couldn't get the data. Uh, yes, so this is a little bit disappointing, but our, um, we would like, in the best of all the world, we would like to, well, have this paper published <laughs> and then try to organize a kind of collaboration with people working on different languages, just l focusing on the problem of antonymy. Is this a real notion? How is it expressed? Uh, report on, our, on my own experiment writing mm -hmm. a dictionary because mm -hmm. I had the intention of putting antonyms also mm -hmm. of dealing with antonyms mm -hmm. and it turned out that with my collaborator we never agreed of, uh, well, mm -hmm. not never mm -hmm. but we not always agreed on what the antonym would be mm -hmm. and we turned out with several antonyms for one word for instance mm -hmm. like you said because mm -hmm. depending on the context to which it applies you will use another antonym uh, word Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. and, and the well, this is this is this is simple because then you can specify the different yes, contexts, yes, yes. and then you will agree, right? Yeah. So, so, so that's why I'm, I mean, if you if you t think that antonymy is not about words but about different senses mm -hmm. in different contexts, then you can, if you still agree, then then it's something, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But the question is, yes. But it turns out there are very few antonyms mm -hmm. in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so perhaps we will, I don't know, destroy, <laughs> destruct <laughs> antonymy after all. And I was probably limited to some, I mean, this is more restricted research, see whether the bad results are more interesting than what's in that. Mm -hmm. Sorry? M make it more restrictive, so to de define it in a certain way and see whether the results may be more interesting than, than otherwise. Mm, that's what we try to do with these different groups. I mean, we, we have 37 words. Some of them are very... Uh, so you have a number of dimensional property words, like big, deep, uh, thick, and whatever. Uh, and they, are, they form a group. And that's where we try to look at the magnitude, and that gives us some result. Then we have another group, which is evaluation. And it also gives us results. But it's very difficult to say something about the whole sample of this 37 so, couple. So perhaps the dimensional, as it has also been pointed out in theoretical literature, so dimensional, dimensional property words are the best uh, examples of real antonymy because even if small and, uh, and big are uh, about different scales and different entities, still you have the feeling that if you apply to one and the same entity, there might be some mm, uh, common scale for, for big and, and, and little. So that's, that's the idea. There are some questions mm -hmm. from people online. I mean, I know it's sometimes hard for you to interfere in the conversation, but please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I might have a question. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, Masha, for your talk. Uh, the 
So it, you were looking mostly at the neg neg negative pairs. And this reminded me of a discussion on a separate domain that I saw online, which was about tin, tin terms. And the, the question whether, you know, so you, you have some languages which where you would have some tin terms which are, um, which are derived from each other, like in, in French, you have pizza and cuisine. Mm -hmm. so cuisine is the phenomenon of, of pizza. And you have other terms which are not derived. Like you have brother and sister, they, they are from different roots. And so there was this discussion uh, on whether we should have a solution. You know, some, someone said sister is the subjective feminine of brother, and then there was a lot of discussion. You know, some saying yes, it is really brothers would say no, it's just two, two different concepts. You have brother, uh, you have sister. These are two different concepts, and and of course this was. I thought of this in this in your talk today when you know you have some some words like good and bad. Should, should, is there such a thing as you know a negative situation? Uh, and would you would someone say that bad is like if uh, bad is to good what impossible is possible? So so you have some cases when the pair is derivation derivative would would we describe the other one as sufficient? I, I intuitively I wouldn't I, I think that I wouldn't go this in this direction, but I I'm struck by the parallelism between the two conversations. You know, is is sister the supplicit feminine of brother? Like yeah. But, uh, but Alex, doesn't this again open a can of worms because there's a lot of uh, a debate on what suppletion is. For some people it's only inflectional, what you have in inflectional paradigms. And for some people it's, it's broader than that. What, what do we gain by saying that it's suppletion? So, yeah, I guess it's so there, there is this par parallelism, right, yes. Mm. I mean, it, it, it raises a question about how this lexicon is Organized. Yes, I mean that's that's th that's what I what I try to start with. It's it's a very interesting question on whether you can find patterns in the lexicon um, where you have um, uh, well regular patterns of deriving words from each other or whatever. When you uh, discover which words are um, well, yes. So patterns and how the the lexicon is organized. My question to you all who work with uh, more exotic languages, uh, how easy is it to translate happy and unhappy to other languages? Mm, easy. Is it? Mm -hmm. Would you, would you... Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Happy, sad, rather than happy. happy, sad. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I answered no. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because uh, I understand that um, when it comes to feelings, propensities, characteristics of people like generous, stingy things like that, these are very culture specific, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And there. 
in those cases it will be dif difficult to first get translational equivalence and also understand if there is a if there is a um, an opposition right so for those cases very often we get some kind of periphrastic construction and people will say well he is not something rather than having an equivalent for the say stingy when you when you have mm -hmm. when you have generous so yeah so i think that again going back to these very clear cases where you have dimensional dimensional uh, adjectives and a few um, other of these very central um, evaluative um, very simple evaluative um, properties perhaps there you can find um, a much clearer pattern in how languages organize their lexicon but but um, uh, broadening this to to the other antonymy pairs becomes very difficult mm -hmm. whether whether the notion itself is is something viable when it comes to this yes uh, a question on frequency did you take that into account with the 37 pairs because going back to that Mm -hmm. um, remark that you made about Matisse, Liszt, and mm -hmm. German. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of seems surprisingly enormous. That you know, sixty thousand roots and eight thousand word families. Now, that wouldn't be used presumably in everyday conversation. Um, that comes back to the question of your mm -hmm. choosing the, mm -hmm. the basic or plain mm -hmm. you know, antonym pairs. Mm -hmm. We haven't done this systematically, but we um, think that a large portion of this will be frequent. But we have to check this. Mm -hmm. Masha, I was curious, uh, why was it so difficult to deal with uh, these property words when they are predicates and not ad nominal, in a, in a nominal construction? Okay, so we, we um, wanted first to make sure that we won't get cases of standard negation, predicate negation. So um, we won't things like we won't get things like um, he is happy, he is not happy. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to get away of the, from the, from this. But then it turned out that in many languages, most of these expressions won't be used ad nominally at all. So we have to allow predicative construction. But then we ask people to tell us, are you sure that this is not a predicate negation and there can be different di different tests for that so semanticians have complicated tests uh, well if you have things like in English uh, he is unhappy then you can say he's unhappy isn't he but he's not happy is he right so you have tech different tech questions and they might be different different questions for this or different semantic uh, questions so we ask people to to help us to sort out that the examples that we got in predication were not just sentence negation mm -hmm. and it's again this turned out to be not not very simple in all cases so we mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. i'm smiling masha because <laughs> in many uh, atlantic languages in particular in Wolof, mm -hmm. but not only in Kiola also there is there are no adjectives mm -hmm. no, not at mm -hmm. all. So you can't escape the predicative construction. Exactly, because exactly. Those mm -hmm. are verbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, also in uh, many Atlantic or men languages, uh, something that you will find elsewhere about the expressing feelings, you know that you use a, a special, specific construction with a body part mm -hmm. that is uh, involved in it. So, uh, and I, I, in that case, I'm not sure that uh, the same body part, you can have a parallel between the positive and negative, uh, happy and... Uh, absolutely, and absolutely. I mean, th this is one of those things that, that, we, that we got. And, and so if you, if you have a language where, I don't know, uh, generous would be his uh, liver is white, and then his, his stingy is, I don't know, his heart is uh, whatever, hot. Uh, or something like that. That, that his things fist become. Is huh? His fist is closed. His fist is closed. <laughs> his fist is closed. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's unclear how we we should we should uh, treat this. And 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 if, uh, if you have a construction like his fist is closed, then we don't count it as a an expression which is appropriate for our questionnaire because this, this is really very far away from. It's not about him, right? It's about his fist or whatever. 
So, so yes, yes. And uh, mm -hmm. so uh, to be unhappy is a problem <laughs> in a way mm -hmm. for some of these languages. Any more questions? Uh, I have one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot of color adjectives, but you didn't pay attention, uh, apparently, to the boundaries of the scale. Uh, if there are upper bounds or lower bounds, you know, is the, the standard is near for example, dirty and clean, or for, for clean, something has to be completely clean, to be, has to be clean, for dirty to be clean. And do you think this uh, doesn't, pay, doesn't interfere with what you said about economy as like that, or it's just because uh, you think can be discarded? Uh, yes, thank you very much for for uh, taking this up. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the scales are a complicated matter. Uh, the problem is that we um, we just have too li too few data data points, so we can't classify our examples in even more in even um, smaller groups. In the beginning, we thought that would there would be a difference between say, contrary and contradictory antonyms, that we will get some difference there. But then it turned out that we just have too few examples. We can't, we can't make any statistical, um, can't, can't draw any statistical uh, conclusions there. So, so it's, the same, it's the same thing here. And dirty and clean, is, it's, it's a very interesting example, by the way, because uh, uh, also how you, how you think about this semantically is dirty, uh, what? Um, <laughs> uh, dirty is the presence of some dirt, or uh, then it's in a way mm, um, positive. I mean, it's, it's magnitude. Uh, it has mo something that cleanness does not have. On the other hand, it's uh, uh, dirty is the opposite of clean in the in the in the um, sense that um, it's unclean. So. Um, um, yes. Yes, and to be dirty, only a small speck of dirt makes you know, the thing dirty. Mm -hmm. While uh, to be clean, the, the thing has to be completely clean. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is upper bound. Or, uh, right, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And will you, your, your slide will be available? Or? Yes, I can put. Yes, I can put them somewhere. Yeah, if you are interested. The whole session is also filmed, and so it will be online on yeah. the website of the Labex, together and with the, the files of yours. Bibliography also. The what? I suppose. Uh, bibliography. The bibliography. Oh. Uh, I will. Uh, I will edit. Yes, definitely. And I, I'm very grateful for all comments and all questions because it's uh, we're still in the process of finalizing the paper, so we, uh, uh, we need these things, we need feedback. Okay, thanks. Any questions or additions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>